We're taking a look back at the first half of this year, plus things will be a little different at the MLB Draft and Home Run Derby. It's Wednesday, July 3rd. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Next week, the Cleveland Guardians will do something they have never done before in the history of their franchise, which is pick first overall in the MLB draft. They have picked second five times, but never had the top overall pick. They'll do so under unique circumstances, which is that they are currently among the leaders in the American League and have a comfortable lead in their division. It's not how things generally go in a league that assigns draft order based on how bad you were the year before and where, with few exceptions, you can't trade draft picks. Well, it didn't receive as much attention as the pitch clock or the on-field rules, MLB instituted a draft lottery last year, presumably to dissuade tanking. The Guardians had the ninth worst record last year and overcame 1 in 50 odds to secure the top pick. They will be followed by fellow Ohioans, the Reds, who made an even bigger jump from the 13th worst record to the second overall pick. Only then will we get to the three worst teams in baseball, the Rockies, A's, and White Sox. Sticking with baseball, the Home Run Derby, which will coincide with the second day of the draft, will have new rules this year. Instead of hitting as many home runs as possible in a time limit, hitters will be limited to 40 pitches over three minutes. The change is meant to assuage concerns that the frenetic pace incentivized by the previous rules could lead to fatigue and injury. Hitters will get one timeout during that three minutes. The second round will be capped at two minutes and 27 swings. Still, the changes were not enough to lure the current home run leader, Aaron Judge, back to the tournament. Judge won the 2017 Derby, but said it exacerbated a shoulder injury he had at the time. He said he'd play again if the All-Star game was in New York. Also unlikely to join is Shohei Otani, who is somehow having his best offensive season yet while recovering from Tommy John surgery. Because he is on the mend and the Dodgers have little to gain from their $700 million man participating, the team is leaning against it. The first to commit is the Orioles' Gunnar Henderson, who has found a new level this year and is tied for second with Otani in home runs. We are halfway through 2024, plus a few days, and joining me now to try to sum up the half year are our breaking news reporters, Alex Schiffer and Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Alex. Welcome, Margaret. Thank you for having us. (laughs) And our newsletter co-authors, Eric Fisher and David Rumsey. Welcome, Eric. Welcome, David. Hey, everyone. Thanks for having us. Yeah, great to have you all on. So um, I'll just throw out the the biggest, most obvious question to, to start with. Um, Rumsey, I'll start with you. What, um, what would you say is like your, your biggest story of the first half of this year? I think one of the most interesting things it revolves around the NFL and selling some media rights to Christmas Day games to Netflix that came out of nowhere a couple months ago. We were shocked originally when we learned that the NFL was going to be playing a couple games on Christmas Day because it's on Wednesday this year. And then they said, oh, wait. The games are going to be broadcast on Netflix, which was not a current NFL media partner. Um, and I don't think everybody realized that that could or would happen. Uh, Netflix jumping the gun on Fox, CBS, Amazon, everybody else. So that that was a huge story to me and one that uh, had people's attention in the spring and is going to bubble back up again this winter when those games happen on Christmas on Netflix. Yeah, I mean, they signed these were they 11 year deals um, with all their like core media partners. And it's like, okay, that's, that's NFL media for the next decade. Um, but yeah, lo and behold, they keep finding ways to, yeah, add more, more games, more, more partners, more ways of making lots and lots of money. Um, uh, as long as we're on the newsletter team, Eric, I'll hop over to you. What, what, comes to mind for you i would actually go broader with the nfl it really for me the this half year was and given that we only had nfl play in the first six weeks of the year this whole six months still really about the power of the nfl record ratings for the super bowl the largest audience in the history of american television record turnout for the draft in detroit uh really unprecedented uh fervor around the schedule release in may uh 
more international games. Uh, and now we've got the Sunday ticket situation going on in addition to what David described with Netflix. You sort of put it all together. Uh, the 800 pound gorilla in, in the industry is only stronger and bigger. And even if this Sunday ticket thing ends up not going its way after all the appeals and everything are exhausted, they're still going to be number one in the, in the business by a huge, huge margin. And these six months really were confirmatory of that. Well, Margaret, let's let's go to you. Um, yeah, what, what what's your big thing for H1 2024? Um, I had two that I thought equally suck out. So, Alex, I really hope I'm not taking yours. But I think the first biggest one has to be just the rise of women's sports. It's been happening for a long time, but the first half of this year was just absolutely bananas. Obviously, we're thinking women's basketball, but not just women's basketball. PWHL had a great first season, broke a lot of records. Um, but just to think about where we were in January um, and, you know, to now with people caring so much about the WNBA, following so much, to think that more people watched the Women's March Madness Championship than the men's um, for the first time, that they drew, you know, almost 19 million viewers. They were just, that's just crazy. That's just really crazy. And, um, you know, unfathomable to think like, even two years ago at this point, that, that those would be viewership numbers that we'd be hitting. So um, that I think is definitely the biggest storyline for me of just how many people started really caring uh, this year and, and how cool that's been to watch that unfold. Um, and then I think the other one that's really big um, and worth talking about, Amanda isn't here. Um, she's on, on vacation right now to talk about college, but just the college um, like athlete payment in whatever way that looks uh, situation has really evolved so much in the first half of this year. Um, I mean, two big examples, you think of the Dartmouth vote as the first team voting to unionize um, the men's basketball team. And then recently the NCAA house settlement where um, the conferences agreed to start, um, you know, to pave, pave the path forward to start revenue sharing with athletes. Um, and there were a lot of other things that have happened along the way, and there's a lot still um, to go and what it's going to look like for athletes to be paid in some ways or whether athletes are employed or whatever, but um, there have been a lot of really, really massive steps in that conversation in the first half of this year. So um, sorry to come in with two, but I think both of those are really important things. Yeah, no, I want to pick up on a couple of those threads in a minute, but first I want to see if Alex still has a topic left or, or if like you were on, you know, pick seven for you. No, I, I am like an all right now that my top pick is still here. I'm like, uh, I'm like a team on draft night. I think it's I, I'm going to go with two as well, but uh, I think it's the year of the gambling scandal. I mean, you have Jonte Porter, Shohei Otani, the Padres guy, all kind of happening like right on top of each other. Um, and I, I think sports gambling continues to kind of like proliferate itself in our everyday lives. I had multiple friends celebrating the other week that they bet on Bronny going 55th months ago when the first mock draft maybe showed hinted at that. Um, I want my friends to be happy, but the source of their happiness is starting to concern me a little bit. Um, so I, I think that we've only seen the beginning of this stuff and kind of how it evolves. As long as there's rules, people are going to try to curb them. Um, and kind of going off of what Derek and Eric said, that wow, that really is Derek and Eric, David and Eric. Trying to read that across my screen at once was tough. Um, I, I think media rights in general, you know, tying to the Sunday ticket thing, I mean, you see all the talk about the NBA media rights. WNBA media rights, what are those going to go for? Does TNT lose it? Amazon getting in the mix? Um, David mentioned Netflix. So I, I think that kind of like the streaming and changing how we look at sports and what the domino effect from the Sunday ticket lawsuit can mean and what does that all look like with the NBA and WNBA media rights deals and the money that that ties into and, and what does it look like from the past media rights deal? WNBA is trying to double theirs. NBA is looking really healthy to do something close to that as well. Um, so that kind of touches on Margaret too with the women's sports stuff. So I kind of hit my own things while hitting everybody else's too. In, in my brain, this is now kind of turned into the next performance enhancing drugs thing where it's like, yeah, every, every year we get a few people who are busted. Like sometimes it's a big name, you know, like Fernando Tatis Jr. A couple of years ago. Um, but usually it's just like, you know, it's like some, some guy you might not have heard of or, um, and, and it's just going to be this thing where it's like, yeah, that's, you know, too bad for them. They they broke the rules and um, now they're facing the consequences. Is that downplaying it too much, you think? Or like, yeah, I don't know, level set for me here in terms of like, eh, how well you think that comparison stacks up? 
Yeah, I think there's still a tension out there. I think your your point is is well taken that we've gone to a sort of different mode on performance enhancing drugs, and our younger players across many sports are just used to being testing, uh, used to being tested, and the players that are caught now, usually there's some other story. Now this latest one had to do with uh, a fertility family issue, um, with the gambling thing. Um, you know, we've we've got some big examples. I mean, Jonte Porter's career in baseball is over. Uh, Ipe Mazuhara's career as being Shohei Otani's guy. You know, I mean, you know that his his prior life is now over. Um, so we have these cautionary tales out there. But I think what's still out there and still unresolved is this tension that. Yes, we have these rules for players and they should be there, but these leagues are still making money from these marketing arrangements. And I don't think your average fan has really reconciled those two things in terms of the enforcement piece that needs to be there and the revenue piece, which the leagues say need to be there, but maybe not. Yeah, but just to your point, Eric, I think the players are very happy with it because we keep seeing everybody's salary cap go up and up and up and a large portion of that, a growing portion of that each year is going to be from that gambling revenue. So those players can rein it in on their end and just not break their league's specific rules, no matter how confusing they might be about whether they can play fantasy football inside their team facility or not. Um, I think everyone will benefit long term as they continue to get more money uh, just by being in the league that is participating in gambling dollars. I feel like there's at some point there's like going to be another like level of scandal here where we find out that some there's a player who's they're not betting but their best friend like seems to always know when like a teammate's injured and you know can like take the under on them or like something like that where it's like insider trading and we we get some kind of like weird sort of blurry line where it's like maybe that's not against the rules but it feels like it probably should be. Well to play into your steroid metaphor there was like the I was at the gym the other night and there was like the documentary on the Sosa Bonds, uh, Sosa McGuire home run chase. I mean, there was a big wave of it in the early 2000s and it was kind of a lull, right? And then there was the Mitchell report and the, um, what was the uh, Tony Bosch thing called? Was that Biogenesis? Yes. Yeah, good memory. Yeah, with A-Rod and all that. I, I, remember, I remember Tony Bosch being on 60 Minutes and he was talking about all the ways in which he learned to beat the drug test for steroids, like where they test... Uh, for the drug samples, like where, um, you know, all the ways to beat it. So like, I feel like we're going to have another one in a few years where it's like someone kind of learned the way to kind of, you know, Jonte Porter was not very good at cheating, in my opinion, the way he kind of walked them across the finish line. If you read the federal complaints and whatnot, um, someone's going to learn to like be smarter than that with it. Right. I mean, that's just kind of like the, the natural way of things. So I, to your point, I think there is going to be something in a few years where, Somebody saw what happened to Jante, what happened to the the minor league guys and everybody, and kind of realized, well, here's what they didn't do that they should have, and maybe that's the next level of all this. And the, and the refs are another piece of concern because these guys are not getting paid the way that the players are, and some of the economic pressures may be a little bit different for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's huge, right? I mean, there is, there's that umpire that's still like waiting to hear his appeal or something, but... Yeah, I mean that's that's the real soft spot, I think, because they can really affect things, and and they're getting paid like you know hundred thousand dollars a year or something like certainly not nothing, but less than John Tay Porter was. To piggyback off Eric's point too, we've had a really weird year with officiating in a lot of sports. You've seen Aaron Boone get tossed out for something he didn't say. Um, the NBA's had one NBA ref quit because of comments on Twitter. You know, there's been a lot of. Uh, tension between the players and the refs there. It's an interesting element with the gambling that kind of put on top of an already simmering, boiling, rocky situation to begin with. And as good as this line technology has been in tennis, it's horrible in soccer. I mean, soccer, we just saw it with this Copa America game. The sport's in a, a complete state of unrest because of VAR. Let's go back to Margaret's uh, comment on the the growth of women's sports. Um, for, for me, the kind of like... The, the question that's been sort of turning through my head on this is if you think of like, you know, MLB, NFL, NBA, these leagues have been around for what feels like forever. Um, so, and, and so they've had all this time to just kind of exist and be around and get big slowly. And now they're juggernauts. Um, the WNBA and WSL, PWHL, 
they don't want to get big in 2050, 2070, you know, on, on that same timeline. MLS, we can throw in there too, if we want, not women, obviously, but they're, they're trying to like, you know, have an accelerator. At the same time, when you talk to execs at these leagues, they'll say like, well, we're kind of just getting started here. Like I know everyone's, you know, waiting for like these, you know, eight, nine digit contracts and all this stuff that we're used to seeing in you know NBA, NFL, but, um, but also, so like, I'm just wondering like how you guys are thinking about like the timeline of how, how big and how quickly can, can these leagues get? Yeah. So it's a really interesting question. The W right now um, is still losing money. The W and its teams are still losing um, millions every year. Um, and a large reason why they've been able to sustain themselves for, I mean, the W specifically for 27 years or whatnot, it's because 40% of it is owned by the NBA. Um, and another 20% is owned by, you know, other investors and whatnot. Um, and so that's really helped keep it afloat. You know, the W, the NBA has really helped keep the, the W afloat at the same time. The W is only taking in about 40% of its own revenue. Um, so it can only grow so much under that model. Um, but then again, it's still losing money. So it's kind of weird. Um, the timeline in terms of you think about those like player contracts and whatnot, um, it's like, you know, right now the players um, only see about like 9% of the WNBA's revenue, whereas with the NBA, it's kind of like that equal 50-50 split. So um, they can opt out of their CBA at the end of next year or, or and then like renegotiate. But again, it's still not going to be a 50-50 split, at least for um, the near future. Um, and so it's really hard with these leagues uh, because there's so much buzz and excitement and people, you know, they're drawing the same viewership numbers. Like the WNBA's biggest games are drawing just as many viewers as, you know, some of the NHL's biggest games. And um, they're really, you know, huge athletes and superstars. But um, at the same time, there's just like the business model is really far behind because the business model is currently developed around a league that didn't have all these people viewing and didn't have all these people coming to games and were filling stadiums that, you know, it made sense for a lot of teams to downsize to 4,000 person stadiums instead of play in the NBA arena and, and not sell it out and have just really empty stadiums. And so um, it, it's hard to flip that switch really fast. Um, I would say in the next couple of years, like there are already teams who are starting to make plans to go to other stadiums or um, whatnot. But I think the player salaries, I would think, would start getting a little bigger um, in the next um two to three seasons um and i mean the last cba was already like record player salaries and, and for the highest level and so um there's already that growth but i think it should start getting a little better i don't know at what point it might be comparable to some of the like major four men's leagues but um i think you know it, it kind of just comes down to like the more the people care the more like you know the rights are going to go up the you know, more partnerships are going to happen and more advertisers are going to want to buy in um, and and things like that. So um, the more valuable these leagues will become and these teams will become. So uh, I, I don't know timeline wise when this will really start getting to, you know, when like WNBA players will start getting like multi-million dollar salaries. I don't know. That could still be like five or 10 years down the road. Um, it probably is, to be quite honest. It's probably not going to happen um, within I mean, Caitlin Clark's first couple of years in the league, um, but uh, they definitely are, you know, headed, heading in that direction. And I think probably sooner than um, these other men's leagues were at, at their, you know, year 27 to year 32 or whatever range that that growth, I think, is going to be more accelerated. But when it's going to happen. And Margaret, you make a good point uh, on WNBA and women's basketball. But I think soccer is where, where there's a really good opportunity for women's sports. You just look at the in WSL, $60 million annual media rights deals and several players with multi-million dollar contracts spread out over multiple years. Um, the team valuations in the NWSL, that league and those players are really flourishing. And that's without some of the big name stars like uh, Caitlin Clark in the WNBA. Um, so th I think that's really interesting just as, as soccer continues to grow, you know, the U.S. might try to bid for another women's World Cup after the men's World Cup. So that, that can only help. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think soccer, you know, there's another women's league launching this fall, the USL Super League that I wrote about not, not too long ago, um, kind of to challenge the NWSL a little bit. Is there enough room for two leagues? I don't know. But 
to soccer in addition to basketball, uh, I see as a big uh, growth opportunity for women's sports. And having done so just only three years removed from a abuse scandal on top of all of the other sort of business growth stuff that we're talking about, what the NWSL has been able to do to sort of overcome and get past that on top of the other other challenges, it, really remarkable stuff. We'll leave it there for now, but make sure to listen to Monday's episode where we talk about what's coming in the second half of 2024 in the world of sports business. That is it for today. We will be off the rest of the week for the holiday. Thanks for listening. Enjoy the fourth. Stay cool and hydrated if you're getting hit with the heat wave. We will see you on Monday.